A common feature of much of speculative evolution is that the modern cast of large carnivorans have somehow disappeared. Large felids, spotted hyenas, bears and big game canids often and often inexplicably vanish for the crime of being too normal. Too much the status quo. And one or more of the Speckyvo roster are picked to replace them. Coropterans have already been discussed in the Future Predators video, but one only mildly touched on in the Mer video are primates. As large charismatic mammals that show good ability to adapt to human areas, and often partially dabble in a spot of carnivory themselves, primates make for a tempting choice to turn into your next top predator. But let's explore how carnivory already exists in primates, how it could hypothetically develop further with generous helpings of fiction, and how this trope is often presented in existing spec evo. So one thing it's worth noting at the start, primates can already be considered top order predators in some ecosystems, Chimpanzees in Kabale National Park preferentially hunt red colobus monkeys, that are often a favoured prey of chimps over much of their range, and their hunting is so frequent and successful that the colobus have entered a population decline. The chimps gradually responded with fewer and typically less successful hunts of other monkeys, like red tails and mangabays, but still prefer colobus. Multiple kills were often common, up to 13 kills in a single hunt, and chimps hunted in large parties from a large population. In short, chimpanzees exhibit significant effects on their preferred prey, greater so than other predators in the area like leopards or crowned eagles. And considering many carnivoran mammals regulate their prey bases rather than depress them, it can be argued chimps have a greater impact on their prey than something like a wolf or a lion does on its own. So for all intents and purposes, primates effectively fulfil the role of top-order carnivores on their prey species with long-lasting impacts on their population trends. The notion of spec evo murder monkeys is still alive and well in our present-day Anthropocene. In smaller ways too, some monkeys can have a diet primarily comprised of animal biomass. Savanna monkeys in some areas have a diet mainly comprised of crabs, which technically makes them predators too. Indeed, a lot of smaller primates can have invertebrates form a big chunk of their diet, as they're an easy way to satisfy protein and certain vitamin needs. But this often isn't really what people are looking for, and it may be worth a moment to address what the goal of some Specivo is. Specivo is typically for fun, and whilst for some the satisfaction of accuracy takes that form, for many more it's much more about creature creativity. For a lot of primates in this genre especially, the goal seemingly isn't to try and create a uniquely primate predator, but to try and recreate another predator using the primate family. Dougal Dixon had his utterly cursed theropod baboons. A Sound of Thunder had... those. And monster hunters Blangonga and Rajang move like and have some similarities to big cats. Indeed, the lion-like baboon is often a tempting trope to fall into, especially with how much Hamadryas baboons look like them already. I personally can't help but find it a little odd that some people wipe out certain animals only to painstakingly remake them with another taxa. It's maybe more understandable with birds, varanids, and crocodilians to try and remake retrosaurs. But then, Spec Evo is often much more wouldn't it be cool if, and much less what would actually happen. And not that there's anything wrong with that. Indeed, it's hard trying to predict what would happen. And for millennia, it's not hugely likely that drastic changes would occur quickly in the future megafauna species anyway. But let's not let that stop us, and try to see what the potential pathways for even more predatory apes could be, and what shape they may take. To return to chimps right now, a few of the things that could be possibly viewed as blocking primates from becoming the predators people would want them to be in spec evo, is perhaps their society. Dominant individuals can readily sponge from subordinate hunters, and among males especially, active hunting can often be spread among rank, to say nothing of the fact it's often, but not always, very male-biased. So if there is an incredible hunter of note in the troop, there's no guarantee it may pass this trait down to its offspring. There's as much of a selective pressure on sponging or begging as there is for hunting for yourself and the male bias makes it hard to have species-wide hunting implications. Already existing social behaviours could provide a bit of an issue for certain behaviours to be developed, and then selected for to cause significant change. 
And it may be worth noting too that it does see most cooperatively hunting carnivores had the carnivory part long before the social part. Chimps aren't the only primates that engage in some predatory behaviour though. Baboons often will, especially males, and most species are reasonable hunters of young ungulates and small animals. But not much more, as baboons live in an environment with some of the stiffest carnivore competition there is, that no doubt has played a large role in shaping their ecology. But in the spec evo world where they've all been zucked to oblivion, what may become of baboons then? Well, it's possible they may get a lot larger. Baboons and gorillas have somewhat similar selective features when it comes to male dominance and sexual dimorphism. The males are much larger than females and have very large canine teeth. Gorillas got massive because they live in a comparatively predator light environment, where they no longer have to sleep in trees, and being bigger is better to protect against the predators that are present, and for males to win or protect troops from other males. Baboon males have pretty similar demands, but also have to sleep in trees or rock faces due to high densities of powerful, nocturnal predators like lions, leopards and spotted hyenas. So there's a limiting selective pressure on their body size. But if we remove such predators, then baboons, like gorillas, may well adapt to a more terrestrial lifestyle. And if we assume reasonably productive savannas can allow for it, presumably and possibly at the cost of smaller group sizes, then they may reach gorilla sizes. Whilst in pure real life it may not be quite as simple as that, after all mandrills live in similar habitats to gorillas but don't reach their size, there is some reasonable ecological backing for giant baboons. Plus, mandrills do still differ from gorillas in group size, living in hordes of up to a hundred and more, as well as diet. Maybe there's a glass ceiling on size for generalist frugivores before you'd have to swap to being a more specialised folivore like a gorilla in a rainforest at least. And after all, that could be more of a prompt for the hypothetical giant future baboons to eat more meat. Their current diet may not be enough to support their large sizes, and there's a large bounty of meat in the form of the assorted ungulates that somehow survived whatever cataclysm took out the large carnivorans. There are larger baboons in the Earth's history too. A purely carnivorous primate may be hard, the majority of them still need some vitamin C in their diets, and their plantigrade limbs, or forelimbs at least, put some limits on open terrain predation. But they could still function as important predators. Bears are large plantigrade footage generalists, and in some areas brown bears are serious predators, either of the calf crop of the year or adult animals in more barren areas. And so, rather than canids or felids, the carnivore and a hypothetical giant future predatory baboon may most resemble is a bear. They may not be hypercarnivorous, but they can still fulfil an important predatory role, while supplementing their diet with assorted fruits and forbs for important vitamins. Baboons may forsake a few things to get there, smaller group sizes for one, and if we apply current baboon biology to the hypothetical ones, the males and females may spend more time apart. Males would likely take larger prey, and may preferentially follow it over foraging with a group. After all, they no longer need to stick together to avoid predators. If they have clearly marked breeding seasons, male baboons may even leave troops entirely for long periods at a time, only returning in the breeding season. The smaller females likely have more vegetable and fruit matter in their diet, and may make different foraging choices too. This isn't so different to lions, whose prides aren't anywhere near as cohesive as often portrayed, with males and females of the pride often spending a lot of time apart due to their different needs and foraging preferences. So these hypothetical future baboon societies may resemble those of some large cats, even if other aspects of them don't. We could even make the fanciful suggestion that this future Africa's predator guild ecologically resembles that of Holocene North America, with baboons replacing bears, future jackals filling the niche of a cursorial predator to become a black-backed or side-striped wolf, and caracals becoming a cougar-like felid. Small predators would also be released from various competitive pressures, and already take large prey semi-regularly, but often get it stolen in large predator-rich areas. But being half the size of baboons, the primates would have a head start on getting large to avoid them as predators. There are some primates that are already fully carnivorous though, and these are the Tarsiers, 
tiny Indonesian primates that are perhaps somewhat similar to bush babies, with limbs heavily adapted for leaping and huge eyes and ears. It's hard to rationalise Tarsiers getting very large though, as relatively solitary primates, the males don't engage in massive fights for females, and any active anti-predator behaviour is limited to mobbing, rather than out-and-out -out violence. So you can give Tarsiers everything they need in all the room in the world, and they probably wouldn't get a lot larger. They're pretty specialist primates, and are pretty good at being Tarsiers just the way they are. But we won't let that stop us. Unlike other primates, it may be the most straightforward route to making a top predator primate, and simple diet could well be the reason for Tarsiers to enlarge in size. The bulk of most Tarsiers' diet is mainly insects, but they will readily take birds as well, and will expend considerable energy killing birds larger than themselves. A bigger Tarsier would be able to take bigger birds more effectively, and with some imagination could become closer in size to some monkeys as bird and bat specialist predators. Some authors have compared Tarsiers to effectively being tiny primate owls before, so it may not be too imaginative to have them become primate eagle owls. The biggest issue would really be trying to create a circumstance where birds ultimately become a more reliable food source than the ever-abundant insects the bird prey base themselves would also be relying on, for Tarsiers to specialise into hunting them over insects. As mainland Tarsiers grow, they may also risk competition, and indeed predation, from civets and birds of prey, but this can also be dodged by potentially putting Tarsiers on their own island. Island hopping to colonise new regions has been suggested as a rare but possible method of Tarsier dispersal, so they could use this to get somewhere predator-free, and then a diet of birds and possibly island gigantism could put them in good stead to grow even larger, as arboreal predators of bigger game, like other primates potentially, should geological or climate factors rejoin their island to the mainland. Obviously, we've taken a few shortcuts here, but as obligate predators and very specialised animals, Tarsiers probably do present themselves as the best bet for a Spec Evo murder monkey. So camouflage aside, Primeval's little carnivorous gremlin may be pretty on the money, considerably more so than the future predators and Mur, at least. Thanks for watching, and as ever a huge thanks to the top patron AI Jose for their support of the channel, as well as Case Sandum, Erengar Steiny, Phenomenon, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, and Bazugazu Bakohatsu Bakomatsu for their generosity as well. If things are sounding a little different, then New Year New Mike. Finally on that Blue Yeti magic like all good little YouTubers, after my old one was starting to falter a bit. Yes indeed, let's all take a moment to remember the Pseudotag ST810, the mic that started it all for the channel. This Spec Evo short was much more around the length I planned for these types of video, but that first one just kept getting longer the more I thought about it. I do have a few more in mind, so we'll have to see how they come out in length too. And as ever, I'm always open to more suggestions for future videos in this format as well. I was planning to save this video for February, for a big old content binge as yeah, the whole YouTube doesn't pay much in January thing is indeed true, but also because I was ill for the second week of January and so Espinas got a bit delayed, and I wanted to put something out. And it was this or another surprise video to come out actually in February but Espanas's script is written at the time of this going out, and so it shouldn't be set back by much more than a week. So I hope I'll see you there for it.